so excuse the dirty windchill, but we are pulling into Clearwater. And I don't know if you guys can see- In 1,000 feet, turn right. Thank you, sir. I don't know if you guys can see it, well, you can't over this building, but um, the eight-pointed cross of Scientology I, is right there. There's one of the big Scientology buildings. We're gonna get out and walk around. This is- Turn right on South Fort Harrison Avenue. So we're going to the Fort Harrison Hotel, which apparently is like, it's right there on the left. I see it, I recognize it. So you guys see the Fort Harrison? Like this is where I think a lot of their, what, what Sea Org? Oh, look, there's some cult members right there. <laughs> Oi, you just wanna tell them to jump in your car and come with you to freedom. There's the Fort Harrison, and I think this is like the main. So Fort Harrison Hotel is right here. You've arrived at your destination. This is Fort Harrison. There's the bridge. I think this is like the main flag ship church or whatever they call it. Um, down this road is a bunch of just, I mean, Clearwater is literally a ghost town, you guys. It is a ghost town. Scientology has like, basically is like taking over the city, which is a, a shame because this is such a pretty area. All right. We're going to park. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I know on Mondays, as of recently, we have been looking through the Emerald Tablets. Um, we're not going to do that today. We are a little bit ahead on my channel than where we are on Aquarius Rising Africa. So uh, bear with us as we try to keep the, uh, the both the channels on the same pace with the Emerald Tablets. Um, but today I did want to talk about a very important topic that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. And I have spoken about off and on, and that is cults. Uh, in the past, I've done shows on the bite model which uh, is basically a really great uh, graph that is behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control to decide whether you are involved in a cult or a high controlled organization. And I, again, I wanted to kind of talk about this a little bit more, especially since we have the 60 day shadow work channel that is coming up really, really soon. Hopefully by the end of the week, I will have your template ready for the 60 day uh, shadow work channel uh, challenge rather that starts on January 22nd. Of course, a lot of you did participate in the 30 day shadow work challenge. And so I just think this is really something very important to talk about. What is a cult? What is a high controlled organization or group? What are the differences between a healthy, um, scholastic or educational shala or school and something that is more sinister and more nefarious and um you know i i personally am fascinated by cults i always have been i love studying religion and i love studying human behavior and i i just think it's very fascinating how people get themselves involved really smart people if you've noticed people that come out of cults are typically very, very smart people. And um, I want to make it very clear that I don't judge people who have been in a cult because any time any one of us are in a very vulnerable place emotionally, then we are basically in prime position to be influenced by a high control organization. What do I mean by this? You know, if you listen to a lot of survivors of these groups, they talk about when they joined, you know, some of them were born into it, which is a totally different story. But a lot of these people joined these organizations because maybe they had lost a loved one in their family and they were trying to reconcile their grief. They wanted answers. Maybe some people are like a lot of us that never really felt like earth was their home. And so they were seekers. And because they were vulnerable, they were easy prey to malignant narcissist. Now, what I will say is something I've said on this channel a lot is that the darkness cannot create anything. 
it can't create anything. Only the light can create. The darkness can just steal from the light, take from the light, and invert and mimic the light. And so we see this a lot with a lot of these um, organizations. There is a uh, Hulu documentary that's out right now that I have watched called The Deep End that goes over the teachings of Teal Swan. Now, I am going to show you Teal Swan's uh, YouTube page right now. Um, in my opinion, this is my opinion. She's a very dangerous woman, in my opinion. In my opinion, based off of what I saw in the documentary about her on Hulu, uh, she's a raging narcissist, a malignant narcissist, and a possibly a pathological liar. Um, now, with that being said, if some of her videos help you, then that's great. If some of her videos are helping you, that's great. You know, there there is maybe some value to what she's saying. Because the information that she's delivering is not information that she herself created, but is coming from actual spiritual teachings. Now, the one thing that Teal Swan does that I find to be uh, very problematic, I hate using that word problematic, but very dangerous, I'll say, is that she is combining uh, a lot of different spiritual beliefs into one teaching. And there's a, there's a, teach there's a saying in India that goes, many wives, many doctors many teachers certain death so what does this mean so there's many different lineages of yoga of healing out there many different in yoga especially there's three different lineages there's ashtanga sivananda and Iyengar yoga there's also a difference between the tantric system of yoga and the patandalin system of yoga and so what that means is now all of these systems are reaching towards the same light the end result is the same for all of these systems but the technique and the manner of which you get to that end result in all of these systems is a different technique okay and so it's like if you were to go into a medicine cabinet and you have all these different medicines in this medicine cabinet now, all these medicines can heal you on their own for specific ailments. But if you combine all these medicines together, you're probably gonna kill yourself, right? It's, it's not gonna be good. Same thing with these techniques. You have to stick to one teaching and work that teaching in order to get to the end result. Now, if you are working a specific teaching, a specific lineage, and you just decide it's not for you, fine. You can then remove yourself from that teaching and go to a different teaching with a different teacher and start working in that technique from the very beginning, if that makes sense. But you can't intercross the two of them. When you start to merge the two of the techniques or the three of the techniques, you're going to end up causing certain death. Okay. And, and that's what I see Teal Swan doing. I see her combining a lot of different techniques and it's causing issues with people. Now she is very, uh, she is very controversial too because of the way that she teaches. I'm going to have to be careful about how I say this, but her teachings on people who unalive themselves, if you know what I'm saying, they remove themselves by choice from the earth, from their, their life. So they unalive themselves. She has a different perspective on this where she she believes that it's like setting a reset button, which that is not true. In my in my learnings and my understandings through the, the text, through the, the scriptures and the text, this is not true. Um, now, if you were to unalive yourself or if you know somebody who has unalived themselves, it does not mean that they are going to be punished. Absolutely not. It just means that they're going to have to keep repeating the same lessons life after life after life until they eventually don't unalive themselves. Um, and a lot of spiritual teachings, unaliving yourself is like a cop out right to to the journey at hand and so i don't believe what she is saying that it is a reset and i think if you are having that ideation if you're having those thoughts then you definitely need to seek help um from a professional right there needs to be some help that's being sought um another thing she uh requires an inner group to like live with her if you watch the hulu documentary it's 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 aggravating to see how she treats people who live with her that's very uh, much a red flag for a cult, um, in my opinion, and I'm not a therapist, I can't make a diagnosis, but from what I observed from her in this documentary, is that she 
possibly is not just a narcissist, but might actually be antisocial personality disorder, which is um, more psychotic. She definitely, from what I see, in my opinion, a borderline. A borderline personality disorder are people who push pull. They believe that their emotions are real. They don't understand that what they are feeling is just their own emotion and their own experience towards a situation. And therefore they lash out. It's like, um, as someone who has borderline personality disorder, if they experience jealousy, then they feel like they are justified in what they do to hurt the person that makes them jealous. Um, uh, you also see a lot of uh, self harm with uh, with people with borderline personality disorder, like that that thing. I can't say it on YouTube. Uh, that's very that's very common with borderline personality disorder. Um, if borderlines are not also if they don't have a co co diagnosis of narcissism, a lot of times borderlines will be co diagnosed with a narcissist personality with narcissistic personality disorder as well. Um, if they aren't though, they're just borderline, and they can be it very much can be healed through therapy. Um, it can be healed. Now with a narcissist, that's usually not the case. You have to be a pretty self-aware narcissist to know that you're a narcissist and go through self-healing. So um, so that's just the red flags I saw with her. Um, but once again, with that being said, it does not mean that you can't take value from some of her videos. If there are some videos that you find value in, then great. Um, but just don't, just be very careful with lionizing. And that's another thing with like cults too. Um, don't ever lionize a teacher. Okay. Don't lionize. Don't wor hero worship a teacher. H teachers are human beings too. We're flawed human beings as well. Um, the only thing that makes me a teacher is that I've just been doing this for a lot longer than beginners have. And so therefore I have more experience I understand the the path that the lineage I teach, which is Ashtanga, I understand it. And so therefore I practice it myself. So therefore I can teach it to others. But with that being said, my role as a teacher is to hold you accountable to the practice, nothing else. So my, my role is not to be lionized. In fact, that makes me really uncomfortable. I'm not going to love bomb you. I don't want you to love bomb me. Um, it, it, and my role is just to work with you in this manner. If you have a question regarding something in your life outside of the practice, I can try to help you through referring you to, to scripture, to yoga scripture, so that you can make your own decision up. But I also, and this is something I want to make very, very clear. Um, most people who are honest and who are not cult leaders in the spiritual world also understand the value of talk therapy and i've been watching a lot of youtubes and podcasts from people who come out of these spiritual cults where therapy was not allowed and i want to make that very clear now regardless of what your feeling personal feeling is on therapy i understand that there are bad therapists out there i totally get that but talk therapy as a whole, I'm not someone that throws the baby out with the bathwater. Talk therapy as a whole could be very beneficial. I had great benefit from going through trauma therapy. And so what I tend to do with my students, if there is a situation that my students are dealing with that is beyond my wheelhouse, uh, what I professionally can do. Now, obviously, inside, I always have my own opinions about situations, but I usually will refrain from giving my my opinion, and I will usually tell, give a student a business card or a list of really good trauma therapists in the area for area for them to contact. Um, and so, in my opinion, that if a spiritual teacher is willing to refer you to um, another healer or an Ayurvedic doctor, then that's a pretty good sign that this person is not trying to control you. Because with cult leaders, what they try to do is totally control you and isolate you from anyone else, okay? So I want you to be very, very mindful of that when you guys start go moving along this journey is, is somebody trying to control your practice in the sense that they are controlling your life. Now, yes, in the yoga room, I have total control because I know I have to keep you from... Um, allowing the ego to cop out of the practice but once you leave the yoga room it's your life i'm not you know my teacher in india i go to india and my teacher has full control in the mysore room you know he he controls who is authorized and who isn't to teach 
I guarantee you, my teacher in India does not give two shits who, me, or you are boinking. Let's just put it that way. I don't know how else to say it because I know kids might be around. But whoever you are boinking right now, my teacher doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care. That's not his business. He doesn't care. Right. And, uh, you know, we all know what Brahmacharya is. He's taught us about Brahmacharya, which is appropriate use of energy, which basically means that you are aware that you carry karma. You are aware that other people carry karma. And so if you engage in a romantic relationship with a partner, you understand that you are picking up their karma uh, because you are energetically and physically intertwined at that point. You understand that you have been taught that. And so now it is your responsibility to make decisions, wise decisions in your life regarding who you're boinking my teacher is not going to get involved right me as a teacher my job is to teach you the philosophy around that but it's your decision over you know if you're somebody that can do polyamory and have multiple partners and be fine that you do you boo that's not me i can't do that i'm monogamous um but that's me right and so it is up to you it's your life journey as to how you handle um, handle that situation another thing is food um, does does a leader want to control what you eat? Um, that's why I teach my students the dosha system. Because knowledge is power and knowledge protects. I'm not going to control what you eat at all. I definitely, in my opinion, believe that people should be vegetarians because I don't believe in eating a living being. I don't believe in eating blood. Um, I take that very seriously for my life. And I'm very open about that belief in my life. But I'm not going to ask my students. I don't know if my students are vegetarians or not. I have no idea. I never ask. Um, and when a student learns the dosha system, they learn that uh, food is energy and they are energy. And so they can better learn how to feed themselves, making better decisions for themselves. Because if you are aware of the dosha system, the dosha system is saying that an apple a day does not keep the doctor away for everyone. Like for me, for example, being Vata, I can't do a raw food, raw fruit diet. It would kill me because I'm Vata. That's Vata food. But for a Kappa person, that might be okay. But that's up for you. That's up to you to figure that out for yourself. And and for me, I mean, I, I can kind of diagnose people with their doshas and I typically do in my own head so I know how to teach a person. But I always refer my students to Ayurvedic doctors to figure that out for themselves. I'm not going to put you on a diet. I don't actually believe in like, restricting yourself i think that as long as you figure out what foods work for you you're good right i'm not going to force you to lose weight or anything like that that's your decision um if you are overweight then you have to figure out why you're overweight what what emotional wound is not being um addressed and that's up to you to do the work i'm i'm just the teacher that's all i am it's like that saying you can uh lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink all i can do is lead you to the water it's up to you if you drink or not Another thing is with, with cults is like when I'm in India, my teacher has no idea where, where we're living. No idea. We have to book our own apartments. Um, once we leave the school, once we leave the Mysore room or, or leave our classes, our philosophy classes or Sanskrit classes or whatever, my teacher has no idea what we're up to. No idea where we're staying, where we're going at night. I don't think he cares. Right. And same with me. Like, so if, if a teacher or a cult leader or an organizational leader, a high control organizational leader is is really invested in your life outside of the religion or outside of the spiritual practice, then that's a red flag um, because any good spiritual leader uh, or teacher is going to understand that there is boundaries. Um, I, as a teacher, I have boundaries. Like I can't, in fact, I try not to get super, super, super close with my students because I want to respect those boundaries. Um, they, you have your own life to live. Uh, in the Mormon Stories podcast, I heard uh, the, the guy saying, you know, it's kind of like religion and spirituality. It's like you have a meal. Religion and spirituality should be the salt that you shake on your meal. Like it's not the meal itself. The meal is your life. And then your religion, your spiritual practice is that salt that you just shake on it to enhance your understanding of your life. Another uh, red flag for me, um, like in the Ashtanga world, yes, if you are committed to an Ashtanga practice, your your primary focus of exercise should be the Ashtanga practice because that's what you're committed to. But that does not mean that you can't do other things. Um, I know many uh, Ashtanga teachers who are very strict about that. They don't want their students running or doing like cycling classes or anything like that. And I'm just not that way. And I've had students ask me like, oh, you know, 
I'm really tight when I do practice because I'm also a runner. Should I stop running? And my question to my student is always, well, do you enjoy running? And if they say yes, then I say, then why would you quit running? Just You'll just be a little tight in your practice. You have to decide what works for you. I can't tell you or force you to quit doing something if you find joy doing it, right? If you find joy doing it, then, then you can work with it. You can work with it and, and you might be a little bit tighter in your practice, but that's okay because it doesn't, you know, having hypermobility or hyperflexibility really means nothing. It's just, a, it's just friction. It's just a practice, right? So I want you guys to be aware of that. No one should be telling you like how to live your life, you know, or, or what you need to do to find joy because that is your journey. At the end of the day, you are the one on the journey. I'm on my own journey. I love bar. I love bar so much. You guys know that. My primary focus is yoga, but I also really enjoy taking bar classes. In fact, I was looking at the other day, actually taking tap dancing because I actually looked at getting myself some tap shoes and I looked at classes online to take tap classes because I enjoyed that. It's not, I'm not doing these classes for any type of, of purpose other than this is what I enjoy doing. And so, um, and so I want you guys to, to take that perception as well. Your practice, your spiritual life should enhance your actual life. You know, for me, for a, a bulk of, for like 10 years of my, my, I've been doing this for 16 years now. So for like 10 of those years, I was heavily involved um, in my studies. I was getting up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I was studying all the time, going back and forth to India, all that kind of stuff. And so my lifestyle at that time, I dated men who were also in this world because that was easier. Because they understood why I had to go to bed early and we could have conversations about the philosophy. And it's not that I wouldn't do that now, but now I'm in a different phase of my practice where I, I actually enjoy having people in my life who are not in the yoga world, you know, and, and, and enjoy having people in my life who do Tai Chi or do other forms of spiritual um, practices because I enjoy the person. It doesn't matter to me what their spiritual modality is as long as they're working on themselves. And this is why in the 60 day challenge, I don't just give you yoga. I give you, um, we're going to be doing the uh, same thing as last time. We're going to be doing bar classes, dance classes, kickboxing, all sorts of different modalities of exercise. And this is a chance for you to figure out in a, in a, in a template which modality of exercise works for you. Now, yes, exercise is 100% a part of, of healing. You have to be exercising uh, because the body, you know, people have this misunderstanding. They think that grounding is just going and putting their feet in the ground barefoot for a few minutes. That's not grounding. When you're, What you're doing when you put your feet in the ground for a few minutes, so lightning strikes the earth and the earth carries energy from the lightning. All you're doing is just rebalancing the energy from that lightning into your body. I don't know if you guys do that. That's what you're doing. When you stand up barefoot on your yard outside is you're literally allowing the energy from the lightning strike that hit the earth to come back into your system. But that's not grounding. Grounding is getting into your body through physical exercise. This is why all these ancient uh, religions uh, like the priestesshood of Isis, um, yoga, all of these, uh, I know I've been released, I'm going to be releasing, releasing a series of, of videos on the different mystery schools, all the mystery schools included exercise, because your body is your GPS system. It's your outline, it's, it's ultimately your body is ultimately your template for it's your syllabus, your class syllabus for this life. And, and it's not one size fits all. So that's why if someone's trying to control your diet, um, one of the people I listened to who got out of Teal Swan's cult uh, talked about how he was doing raw food and it just really messed with him. And I wanted to hug him and say, yeah, raw food is terrible. Doing an all raw food diet for a human being is terrible for a human being. Animals, different story. Yeah, or if you're a super kappa person, then maybe a raw food diet would be good for you. But if you're this guy, obviously was not kappa. He seemed very vata to me, so that is why it didn't work for him. But if you and I don't know, I have no idea if Teal Swan is forcing them to follow a specific diet or not. I have no idea. But if she is, that's super dangerous, right? It's not one size fits all because every body is carrying a different template. And that is one thing about Till Swan as well. It's that she has this perception from what I see, 
she has this perception that her way of healing is the only way of healing. And that's just not true. As I said a few moments earlier, all these practices are all reaching towards the same life. The outcome for all, whether you're doing Tai Chi, yoga, Reiki, whatever, the outcome is always the same, but the path to get there is different. Now, things like Reiki can be um, intertwined with yoga and to other different because it's it's a healing modality that's really just regenerating your energy so it's reiki works with you where you are it's not going to interfere with um whatever template you're using because reiki works with it right um and so that's dangerous if if your teacher is saying this is the only way to achieve uh enlightenment or peace then um if that if they're saying that that's a red flag that's a huge red flag because everybody's life experience is very different. And um, I mean, just look at our different bodies. I am you know, five, four, five, five in height. I'm very thin. I'm very bony, blonde haired, blue eyed, almost 40 year old woman. I'm Vata Pitta. So my energy disposition is high energy, uh, prone to anxiety. All these things are mine. This is what I have to, this is my friction. This is what I have to work with in this life. But someone who is maybe five foot tall, 200 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes, they have a different friction. Okay. They have a different obstacle than I have. And so that's what's going to work for them. They had to figure out what works for them. No, no, there's not one size fits all. Okay, even in the Ashtanga world where we have a set practice, it isn't one size fits all. I work with students um, with the same practice in different ways, depending on who that student is. So that is very dangerous. What she's doing, in my opinion, is extremely dangerous. Um, there's also the documentary. She made a comment where got, someone called her out and was like, well, who's your teacher? This is important. You guys have heard me say this before. Every person who is a healer has to have a teacher, someone that they are accountable to. I am accountable to KPJAYI. My teacher is Sharat Joyce. He's the Param Guru of the Ashtanga lineage. I have paperwork that shows my education. All right. Sharat was accountable to Patabi Joyce. Patabi Joyce was accountable to Krishmacharya. There is a lineage here. Okay, well, somebody called Teal Swan out on this, like, who's your teacher? And this is what she said. She goes, if you take all the runners in the world and you find the fastest runner, and he's the fastest runner in the whole world, are you not going to go to him because he doesn't have a mentor? And the guy was like, are you saying that you're the master, you're the best? And she kind of said, like, yes, and she's not. She's not. And if a teacher has that that attitude that they are the best at what they do and they don't need um, guidance, that is First of all, that's called spiritual manipulation, and that's a sign of a cult or a narcissist, um, and that's bad. Like, and, and that's what um, you know. We look at things like the Yoga Alliance. Uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, the Yoga Alliance is horrible. You do not want to be involved. In my opinion, you do not want to be involved in the Yoga Alliance. Um, it is a scam, one hundred percent. It's a scam. You cannot become a teacher of yoga in two hundred hours. It is not possible. Okay. When people want to become doctors, what do they do? They go to medical school. When people want to come to become Ayurvedic doctors, what do they do? They go to Ayurvedic schools. If you want to become a yoga teacher, what do you do? You go to an actual yoga school. You go to India. You spend years. It's not 200 hours. What degree, what degree do you get in life that's 200 hours? No, it takes years. You literally go back to university when you want to be a yoga teacher. And so be careful with stuff like that. Be careful with the, these kinds of like pyramid -y scams. Um, just be very mindful of that. I also want to talk about um, some of the, like when we look at like, so I've been trying, I've, I've been studying Scientology for a while now, just cause I'm curious. It's, it's a load of shit. It's, it's all fake. Um, and some of the, the the two channels I like the the best are Aaron Smith Levin. He's growing up in Scientology. That's his channel. I'll link all this down below. Uh, Chris Shelton. I really like Chris Shelton. This guy is really good. Like he he has uh, he's very talented um, when it comes to teaching. I don't know much about his history. If maybe he was a teacher, I don't know. He just uh, just watching the way that he talks about. 
the history of Scientology and explains things. He does a really good job. He's very engaging. And so this is a really good channel to learn more about. So he's an ex-Scientologist. Um, he is, I guess, considered a suppressive person now by the Church of Scientology. So I, I've actually tried to get in touch with both Aaron Smith Levin and Chris Shelton because I would love to have them come on my channel and we can um, talk more about this, more about what um, what cult behavior is like, uh, red flags, all that kind of stuff. And um, Scientology, so it, it was founded by a man named L. Ron Hubbard, who I guess a lot of people know him as a fiction writer. And he wrote this book called Dianetics. Now, I've never read Dianetics, but I have listened to a lot of talks on Dianetics. And Dianetics itself, there's a lot of truth in Dianetics. Um, it's a lot about the reactive mind, which is what um, we talk about in yoga. Yoga is all about the reactive mind. Yoga to, to Virginia Rodeha and learning how to understand your thoughts, right? What are your thoughts? Now, where um, Scientology or where, where, again, the darkness can't create anything. It can only steal from the light and invert and twist, right? So yoga, like Patanjali is basically saying like you have the power, you are the problem, like you are, you are your own um, savior, you are your own victim, it's all you boo. So basically Patanjali is like, here's a practice designed to help you understand your thought patterns, your, your yoga chittam vritti nirodaha, so that's Sanskrit, that's the second sutra of the first pada, which means uh, chittam is mind, vritti is thoughts. Nirodaha is nothingness. So yoga chitam vritti nirodaha. It is yoga is finding no thought. Now we can't find no thought because we are human. So what's the next best step? And Patanjali goes through this throughout the whole sutras. The next best step is to learn how to observe your thoughts and understand that your thoughts aren't really you. They're not real. They're just your reaction to past traumas and past experiences okay and this is where we get into the, uh, the idea of shadow work which is something till swan talks about a lot but till swan's perception on shadow work is not my perception on shadow work and it's not a perception i've ever heard educated healers take on shadow work so if we're back to scientology though if we're talking about your thoughts and yoga is understanding like one of my favorite quotes is don't believe everything you think so yoga is teaching you not to believe everything you think, to understand that your thoughts have the ability to basically make or break you, right? And to also understand where your suffering comes from. And your suffering comes from the fact that you think that your eternity is who you are in this physical world, but this physical world is eventually going to die. And so that's not eternal. So that's not really who your soul is. And that's kind of what science, kind of from what I understand what science, Scientology is saying as well. Scientology though, kind of where yoga basically says it's all your fault. So therefore you're the person who, that's the good news. The good news is it's all your fault. So you can actually be the one to, to, to course correct. Scientology on the other hand, from what I understand basically says it's not your fault because they have this thing called things, which reminds me a lot of what the church would call demons. Now I'm not saying demons aren't real. Demons are very, very real, but not many people are being attacked by demons. Most people are actually dealing with their own darkness, right? It's their own stuff. It's their own friction. And, and as we learn through yoga and shadow work, your darkness, your shadow, your your hard stuff is it's where you get that friction. It's where you get that spark of light. So it's really a service to you to go through the dark night of the soul because that's where you have the suffering because pain is real to actually ignite the light, right? Where Scientology believes that these things called thing, this is where it gets into the alien stuff with Xenu, which South Park did an excellent episode on on this, and 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 I and we, I do believe in aliens. I do obviously a lot of us on this channel do believe that there are is extraterrestrial life. I'm not saying that's not true, but what Scientology says is that you are carrying around all these spirits, these things that are directing your thoughts, and that's not what yoga is saying. Yoga is saying no, you, no, that that's all you. You're the one who's directing your thoughts, and so they have this. Like there was a great. Um, I think it was a documentary a few years ago. I've seen it. It's been a long time since I've seen it called Going Clear. Because they talk about going clear, clearing yourself of all these Thetans because you, you yourself are a Thetan that needs your spirit to not have other influences, all that kind of stuff. And it costs a lot of money. They charge so much money 
for it's a pyramid scheme to go up the bridge. They have you OT1, OT2, OT3. They have you go up these bridges. You're taking these auditing classes where you hold the cans and the e-meter reads and, and all that kind of stuff. Now, once again, as I said, the basis of this stuff with the reactive mind is very much, there's a lot of truth there. And there's a lot of really helpful stuff. Even a lot of the people that have left Scientology will tell you that their um, lower classes, like not the bridge work, but the other classes, there's some benefit to these classes. That, but they're not... These are not concepts um, or theories that were created by L. Ron Hubbard. They just weren't. Um, they were. They're in the Vedic texts. They're in the Upanishads. They're in the. They're. They're thousands of years old, right? But L. Ron Hubbard shifted and, and made this um, religion, if you will. It's not really a religion, but made this 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 uh, cult. This, uh, in my opinion, cult uh, high control group based off of this this theory with these thetans and going up this bridge now scientology is notorious for doing something called fair gaming there is a podcast with mike render i would love to also talk to mike render and leah remedy i did see send leah remedy a note so i'm hoping that i can get her on my show um she did the aftermath uh the science i think it's on netflix or amazon prime where you can go back and watch the aftermath of leaving scientology and they do something called fair gaming which is what narcissists do and this is like a smear campaign to the extreme where they will try to end a person who speaks out against scientology and I actually had somebody um had somebody warn me like are you sure you want to go down the scientology road because they come after people who challenge them and I, my response was listen i've already had five death hits put out on me by a coven of witches i've had all my money stolen. I listen, hit me with your best shot. If I have still survived after everything that's happened to me this past year, if you're new to my channel, that's a whole new different subject of what I've been through. Um, you know, Scientology like can hit me with their best shot. It can't be worse than what than what I've been through this past year. And at this point, everybody knows. I think everybody knows Scientology is a joke, but the Scientologist. As you saw in the beginning of the episode, I have been in, in Clearwater. Um, I've been to Clearwater a couple of times. Um, I will say one thing, like, even though Clearwater, which is like the Mecca of Scientology, it's like, it's Salt Lake City or it's Vatican. Um, even though it's kind of a ghost town now because literally there are no Scientologists, looking inside the windows, they do a really good job of keeping it very clean. It looks very clean. And everyone I, I walked past who had a Sea Org uniform on, which the Sea Org is like they're, you know, people that really like are invested in the in the religion, um, all were very nice and smiled. I mean, it wasn't like they were, I have nothing against the people. Um, all the people that have come out of Scientology seem to be very intelligent, kind, good hearted people. I think they really think they're doing something good for the world they just don't understand they're under the leadership of a narcissistic in my opinion a narcissistic psychopath l ron hubbard passed away in the 80s and now is under the leadership of a man named david miscavige um just horrific stories about him but scientology goes to the extreme of control um they practice something called a uh, disconnection uh, or some some cults call it shunning and this is a huge red flag too so remember how I said earlier, like, I like hanging out with people now who don't practice Ashtanga. Like, I, I enjoy other people as long as they're doing something to better themselves. I don't care. In cults or high control organizational groups, you cannot associate with people who are not doing the same thing you are doing. Um, so if you are, let's say that you are married and you and your husband are in Scientology and let's say that I'm married to a Scientologist and I decide that I don't want to be a Scientologist anymore. And so I want to leave the church. My spouse will then be encouraged to divorce me and not speak to me anymore because I've left the church or I've left Scientology. This is a huge red flag. I know I've heard this from Teal Swan as well, that there is a disconnect from people in the outside world. Now, why is this? Because if you are trying to gain control over someone, then you're not going to want them to have anybody in their life that can be a voice of discontent. So that is one thing that I love about my teacher. That's not a thing with my teacher. My teacher doesn't care if your spouse is practicing yoga or not. My teacher doesn't care what religion you are. My teacher is not trying to convert you to Hinduism. 
but that's because the practice can stand on its own and it can handle the criticism. If there's criticism, it can handle it. It's not concerned, you know, it, there's integrity there. And so therefore it's not concerned with criticism or Scientology, Teal Swan, the Moonies, I can go on, the children of God. There's so many of them that cannot take criticism and so forth. They, 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 they therefore will smear any person. I mean, look what happened to me a few months ago, the smear campaign, that was a smear campaign propagated by a malignant narcissist psychopath okay this person that propagated this smear campaign is a woman who is in the cabal the cabal itself she is playing a part in the truther community to spell cast people to, to pay, take people down a path that is not a true path um she can't handle any type of pushback from people she can't handle it because she is herself is in a cabal she isolates people um she keeps people from not speaking to each other if there's a voice of discontent the people she has as her followers she will not let them speak to those people anymore and she will enact those followers to act as flying monkeys to also try to trash the person smear the person fair game the person who is speaking out against the narcissist the cult leader and that's what happens in scientology as well so all these really good people who are scientologists are that are now um kind of employed to wage war against people who literally are just expressing their concern are saying something's not right now one thing i will say if chris shelton or aaron smith levin which i'm going to tag them in this do see this video you guys you keeps and mike render does this too and so does leah remedy leah remedy did this on the joe rogan podcast which was a great interview i will put that down in the description box too um you guys you have to stop saying that christianity is an occult you have to stop it i love you guys i think you're amazing but every single time i hear you guys say well the christian church doesn't do this but scientology does i want to pull my hair out yes the christian church does do this um another thing about cults and high control mind control groups is censorship so for chris shelton aaron smith levin mike render leah remedy a lot of you guys who were not raised in a church a christian church because you were raised in scientology the church the christian church across the board practices more censorship than any it's got scientology beat ha tenfold hands down okay there are supposed to be 700 77 books in the canonized bible there are only 66 of them that we can look at and those 66 books have been changed and edited like crazy the 711 books that are missing from the bible are hidden in the vatican no one is allowed to see them but the upper echelon of the bishops and the popes a few of these missing books have been found and so i've covered some of them on my channel there's like 45 of them that have been found and those missing books tell a very different story than what the canonized bible tells another example of this is the geneva bible which was the first bible that was ever written in english and king james had the geneva bible basically destroyed and he created the king james bible which is the bible that all bibles are based off today the niv all of them are based off of the king james bible which was made up by king james the church also does mind control where from a very young age you're taught to repeat over and over and over again in church that the bible is the word of god but there's no proof that the Bible is actually the Word of God. And if you start to research the Bible, you know it's not the Word of God. It's actually the Word of Lucifer. You start to understand this, especially when you look at the censored work. And so you, and so people then, what happens is people get under mind control that they believe the Bible is the Word of God because they've been, been taught to repeat that over and over and over and over again. And so when somebody comes up and says, hey, I have proof that what we're learning in church isn't correct, they then will threaten you so for chris shelton aaron smith levin mike renda Le mike renda leah remedy all you guys saying i have a file full of death threats that have been sent to me by christians and i have i've had to hand some of them over to the fbi some over to the police um it's gotten very scary so please stop saying that also the christian church as a whole has more blood on its hands than any religion out there you know i know i know you guys have talked about the links that david miscavige will go 
to hurt people who speak out against Scientology, um, but he won't kill people. That's like, the, that's the boundaries. Like he won't actually put a hit on someone. I've had a hit put on me by the Christian church, an actual hit. That was the first time I ever military ever got involved with me because I had an actual hit put on me. And now I've had multiple at this point, but I've had hits put on me by the church. So please stop saying that. The church does this too and goes further. They go, they go further. They want to kill. They actually will kill people. Okay. Um, the, the Christian church has more blood on its hands than any religion in the world. Inquisition, witch trials, all this stuff. People were slaughtered, were slaughtered. And not just for saying they didn't believe the church, but for maybe questioning one thing about the church. They were tortured to death. So you guys got to stop saying that the church is just as guilty, if not more guilty than Scientology. Okay. And I will be happy if you guys want to see all the death threats I've gotten, I will be happy to show them to you. This is serious. So please, please, please stop discrediting people's experiences coming out of other cults, which I do believe the Christian church is a cult. I mean, the church alone, the name church, um, when Yeshua was alive, his name wasn't Jesus. It was Yeshua. When Yeshua was alive, um, the places of worship were called temples not churches church comes from the scottish word kirk which comes from the greek goddess circe and she was the goddess of mind control and she would feed off of people so even the name alone is bad is real bad so please 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 stop saying that about the christian faith please please have respect for those of us who have also been had our lives threatened um, by this organization we just because we weren't raised in scientology does not mean that we were not raised i mean here chris shelton has cults coercive control there's so much coercive control in christianity um christianity also that the churches are also really big and i'll have to be careful how i say this um carpooling children carpooling them starts with a t big time big time probably the top of the totem pole when it comes to that that kind of stuff i know scientology is in trouble for that as well but the christian church has got scientology beat hands down when it comes to the number of people there's a lot of whistleblowers out there i can put you in touch with whistleblowers who have been through this so you guys gotta stop saying this about the church just because it's not as new as scientology and and uses different words than scientology uses doesn't mean it's not doing the same thing um you are also very much uh you know that was a big thing like you were supposed to marry someone who's also a christian i don't listen i don't at this point i don't claim any religion i'm just a spiritual being just trying to figure it out i'm a seeker um but uh if i i know many people who are not encouraged to marry outside of the christian faith you know it's kind of like the mormons and the jehovah's witnesses and i mean these are all versions of christianity as well too so but that one issue I have, I know you guys who are, are activists for um, for Scientology or for protecting people from Scientology, I understand that you guys, you're, you don't understand that because you're not coming. You're, you're probably seeing the Christian church just from an outsider's perspective. So you, don't, we, you wouldn't know maybe that all this stuff is going on, or especially if you haven't studied the history of the church. But just be careful saying that. But other than that, you guys, I will put these channels down at the... I love, I listen to... Aaron Smith Levin almost daily. And I also listen to um, Chris Shelton a lot as well. I love these guys. They have great podcasts. So make sure you check them out. If you know them or if they're watching, I would love to have you guys come on my channel. I would love to talk to you about your experiences. So you can, I, I have definitely wanted to do a deep dive of, of chronologically talking about Scientology, what Scientologists believe, um, where it comes from. But I do understand that I cannot do it justice because if you look at the information on Scientology and then you listen to these people who are ex-Scientologists, if you listen to their their podcast it's a very different experience and so a lot of what i've actually learned the truth about scientology has come from their podcast and so I, I i would love to have you guys if you're listening come on my show you can tell your story we can talk about um mind control all that kind of stuff we can talk about the yoga sutras versus what L. Ron hubbard tried to do where the crossover is why the practice of yoga is healthy and why Scientology is not healthy. Now, with that being said, with that being said, there are yoga cults. There absolutely are yoga cults. In my opinion, Kundalini Yoga that was started by Yogi Bhajan, total cult. Total cult, in my opinion. I've had terrible experiences with uh, Yogi Bhajan's followers. There's a lot of, of information out there about Yogi Bhajan and the scams that he was involved in before he passed away. He definitely knew he was scamming people. And so there are definite yoga cults out there. And that is one thing, too. 
I want you guys, especially if you're doing these shadow work challenges, like, and you want to find a yoga shala, these are red flags that I'm, I'm hoping you guys will look for because there are bad people in the yoga world too. Um, I'll give you an example, spiritual manipulation. So another, um, another aspect of cult mind control is that only the leader or certain uh, members of the clergy or whatever you want to call it are have certain relationships with God. Um, that is not true. Every single human being on this earth, Teal Swan does this as well. She claims that she has a special sensory, uh, she has special clairvoyance where she knows things. Um, everybody's got that, guys. Some people aren't in touch with theirs yet, but there's no one that's more superior to you when it comes to God. You are your own prophet. You are your own channeler. You, teachers just help you find it on your own, but you you always trust your gut over what a teacher says. Um, now, where, where, oh yeah, I was like, where was I going with this? Okay, so uh, there was a person um, that I'm gonna have to be careful to say this, that I knew in the yoga world. Um, he's actually the one that broke my sacrum. He wrote a book about his uh, addiction to drugs and how yoga like saved him from, from drug abuse. And in the book, he spoke about how uh, the practice of yoga yoga took away the scars from heroin, the, the the injection marks on his arm from heroin. And when I first read this, I was like, that's not true. That can't happen. Listen, I got scars all over my body. I had an appendectomy when I was 12. I have a scar going across my stomach. I have a scar on my back. I got scars on my fingers here where my sister slammed my car, my hand in the car when we were getting Christmas trees as a kid. I have a scar on my ear from where I had ear surgery as a kid. I got scars all over my body. Not once has the yoga practice ever changed these scars. And it's not going to. I'm not expecting it to, right? I don't mind the scars. Everyone's got scars. So the fact that he wrote this in the book that he, this yoga practice, like, took away his heroin abuse scars are just not true. And I actually went and contacted a bunch of um, recovery uh, clinics and asked about this and all of them said, no, that can't happen. Once you have that scar, it's going to take a while for that scar to subside. And I realized when I went back and looked at cult behavior and narcissistic behavior that this is a trick called spiritual manipulation. And basically what this guy was doing co consciously or subconsciously was trying to get people to think that he, for some reason, had some special relationship with the power or some special way of doing the practice um, that was going to generate that kind of healing. So therefore, you needed to listen to him and trust him. And that's just simply not true. So you have to be careful with spiritual manipulation. I think a lot of religions mess around with spiritual manip manipulation. In my opinion, Teal Swan is poster child for spiritual manipulation and abuse. Um, and so, so yeah. Now, um, I hope that I hope this episode wasn't like a clusterfuck of stuff. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Once again, we will have the sixty day template available very soon. Oh. Shadow work. I wanted to, to touch on shadow work. So the 60 day shadow work challenge, it's coming up. So I, I was listening to people talk about how Teal Swan refers to shadow work. And it's like digging deep as to the truth that you think about yourself. And that's not my interpretation of shadow work at all. And shadow work is a, a very powerful tool. And on the Mormon podcast, he, the Mormon stories podcast, he spoke, the guy who conducted the interview spoke about this. And he was very clear where he said, Shadow work is a really good tool to help people heal if done properly. But if it's put in the wrong hands, like someone like Teal Swan or Scientology, it's going to backfire. So what shadow work is, is it's looking at your own shadow. So it's looking at the things in your life that trigger you. Your triggers are your golden lotto tickets, right? It's like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Like that's your golden ticket. So if you can lean into that, if you can understand that anger so what is anger anger is a sign of hurt so where is that hurt coming from now you don't need to know where it's coming from and saying that you don't need to have a story associated teal swan from what i understand we'll try to get people to have like memory regression and so sometimes people feel like they have to make up a story you might just have anger for a reason you don't understand and that's okay. My my trauma therapist was not, she did not want me remembering certain things. If my mind couldn't remember something, we were going to leave it. We were just going to work on the emotion because the emotion is the side effect. That's what we need to heal is the actual emotion. Okay. So with the 60 day shadow work challenge, if you did the 30 day shadow work challenge, you're, you're more familiar. But for those who are new, what we're doing or what you're doing rather is you are 
using the template that I sent you. So like day one of the days, you'll have to do like a 45 minute kickboxing class, then you'll take like a five minute cold shower. And then you'll like meditate for 15 minutes with a recording. And then you're going to have to journal and I've got questions I prompt for you for you to feel like what thoughts came up for you, what emotions came up for you. And then you start to um, journal about those emotions and those thoughts so that you can settle into that and figure out why you react certain ways. Again, it goes back to that reactive mind, which is the same thing talk that's spoken about in Scientology as well as yoga, the reactive mind. So you are, are now facing your own darkness, your own shadow side. Now, I am just the person who created the template. I have used my education to create the template. I'm not there with you every day. And as I say in all the shadow work challenges, everything that's on the list for you to do during the day you don't have to complete all of it it's up to you how much you want to do it is your choice it is your practice it is your life i'm just giving you a template that's it now when it comes to healing these traumas there's different methods of healing them you know you can go the complete yoga yoga route where you are literally just in the moment with these emotions and working through them and allowing yourself to cry you can go through trauma therapy um through shadow work we, we're often presented with um emotions and thoughts that we didn't even know we had okay and so when that happens when that comes up it is your choice you can go see a reiki healer you can go see a quantum healer which is what amanda who's also a sponsor for the challenge offers you know we're not going to tell you none of us who are sponsors are, are putting are put, putting together this template are going to tell you how to heal we can give you advice we can give you what we've done and what we know. I can I can guide you through my education on, on what I know how to do, but I can't tell you how to do it. You have to do that yourself. All right. That is your that is your power. I again am a huge supporter of talk therapy. That really helped me in my stuff, but it's up to you what you do. Um, we do have a support group on Signal, which I will attach to the uh, template when I email it out. If you want to join that, that's a great, there's great resources. There's over 200 people in that support group. And so everybody can give you their advice. If you have an issue and you want advice, there are over 200 people in there that can give you advice over what they've done in the past, what's worked for them so that you can figure that out for yourself. So your shadow work is literally just facing that side of you that is holding you back because it's your obstacles. It's what's uncomfortable it's your pain and once we face the pain once we openly talk about our pain the pain start starts to to lose its effect on us right and and exercise is a great way to spark that to show you and so that's my perception on shadow work it's not teal swan's perception on shadow work right it, it's her in my opinion her perception on shadow work is dangerous in my opinion Okay, my perception of shadow work and the way it's been taught to me and my education system is that it's literally up to you, right? It's literally you, okay? You don't have to have some um, crazy trauma story to do shadow work. You don't have to have been like carpooled as a child, if you know what I mean, or, you know, had some type of horrific abuse to do shadow work. A lot of people have had that those traumas but that doesn't it doesn't mean that every human being as long as you are living you're going to have triggers and you're going to have something to work on okay it could just be that you know you're, you're still triggered by the fact that maybe you dealt with a bully in kindergarten i don't know it could be something as simple as that but it's still something that's offering you an opportunity to look deeper at yourself yeah I hope that makes sense. Oh, I had somebody say that they don't like that I ask if that makes sense to you guys a lot when I'm doing these spiritual videos. And to that person who said that, my job off of YouTube is to teach spirituality, philosophy. Um, I'm the only female authorized in the state of Georgia. That's something that I'm very proud of myself for doing. And I love what I do. I love this work. I love this line of work. I love people. I love seeing people succeed um, and heal themselves. It brings me joy to see other people um, realize and have those aha moments of how amazing they are. And so I'm going to continue asking people if what I'm saying makes sense. Because if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense to someone, I want to know because I want to try to explain it in a better way. Because I, I am here to help and um i'm not here to control i'm not here to listen i, I don't i don't want to control anyone i have a hard enough time controlling my dog on his damn leash i don't want to control i want to help you 
be able to to find the power within yourself, right? And so if I'm saying something that someone is confused about, I want them to feel comfortable enough. That's why I ask, does that make sense? Because I want the viewers right now to feel comfortable enough to say in the comment section, hey, Bryce, you said this, this, and this, but I'm, I'm confused about what this means. You asked if that made sense to me and it doesn't. Can you explain a little deeper? And I will be more than happy to try to explain it in a different way. So for that person who said they didn't like if I asked that that made sense, my comment back to you is then find somebody else who doesn't ask you if that makes sense. Because I guarantee you people like Till Swan don't ask if it makes sense. They just want you to do it. Okay, so if you have a problem with me asking that, then that's your problem, not mine. So um, I will continue to ask that to my viewers if that makes sense because I want to help. And if what I'm saying, again, is confusing to them, I want to clear it up for them. So... All right. With that being said, if you guys have any questions or if there's something I didn't get to cover, let me know down in the comment section below. Again, I'm, I'm hoping to get more into like cult programming, deeper, deeper programming, because I don't, you know, one of the biggest issues is there's cults everywhere. It's not just spirituality and religion. There are science cults. There are academic cults. There are fitness cults. There are some MLMs are cults. So it's, we just know the religion and spirituality the best because that's what's so in our face. And it's, it's sad because as I said in the beginning, everyone at some point is vulnerable to a cult because we are all pondering life. We all are questioning our own mortality. And so if someone comes along and says, I have the answers, we tend to fall for it sometimes. And no one has all the answers. We're all just trying to figure this out together. So any questions you have about that, please ask me down in the comment section below. Once again, if you missed our video on Saturday, I now, you now can practice with me live on Sunday mornings uh, at Sacred Garden. If you don't live in Georgia, you can sign up here through the virtual option. It's 8.30 a.m. That's Eastern Time on Sundays, every Sunday, unless it's a holiday. Again, I would suggest if you're not, if you've never done Ashtanga before, please try it with a teacher in person before you take the virtual class because I'm not able to adjust you and I just want to make sure everybody's safe. If you're not familiar with the Ashtanga Half Primary Series, which is what I teach on um, Sundays here at Sacred Garden Yoga, then I will put a link to Ashtanga Nurses Half Primary Series down in the description box below so you can watch that and try that as well before you come and take the virtual class with me. Also, we still have sign-up space available for the Yoga Online Intensive with me. It's a Yoga and Reiki Intensive that's run by myself and my friend Enemy Simpson. That starts on Sunday, January 22nd. It's a four-week course course. Um, all the information is right here. I will put this down in the description box below. It's a $500 course. Um, this includes two private Reiki sessions with Emmy. You will have homework, so only serious uh, students should apply. There's also options here for you to take a private lesson with me. So if you want to take a private lesson with me, it's all down here in the description box below. All right, you guys. Um, I hope you're having a start to a fabulous, fabulous week. I hope you're all doing well. Best is yet to come and I will talk to you soon.